Welcome everybody to the VCSU Visiting Artist Talk. Uh, welcome to everybody from VCSU staff, faculty, students, potential students, friends, family, everyone around the world. Welcome. Uh, my name is Assistant Professor Angela Mir Mirso, Director, Director of the VCSU Gallery and Department Chair here at Valley City State University. Today we welcome Amanda Breitbach, who will be talking about her exhibition, Land and People. I'm just gonna do a quick intro for Amanda, really quick before I pass it on to you. Um, Amanda Breitbach is a photographer and an artist whose research typically focuses on the relationship between people and land. She teaches photography as an assistant professor of art at Stephen F. Austin State University in Natacadochus, Texas. Breitbach grew up on a family farm and ranch in eastern Montana, and she earned her bachelor's degree in photography and French from Montana State University and a master's of fine arts degree from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Welcome, Amanda Breitbach. Thank you so much, um, Angela. I really appreciate um, you having me here. Um, here virtually um, to speak to anybody who, who is listening today and also hosting my exhibit um, at the McCarthy Gallery at VCSU. Um, so I wanna just jump straight into the presentation, but I do wanna mention that if you have any questions as we're going along, um, you can type those questions into the chat and we will answer questions at the end. Um, so let me share um, with you. So um, my, my notes to myself begin with just thank yous. Um, so thank you to everybody who is joining us for this talk, um, which accompanies my ex exhibition of land people, as Angela already mentioned, um, at Valley City State. Um, thanks to Valley City State University for hosting my exhibit and especially to the faculty of the art department for their assistance in organizing the exhibition, this talk, and a workshop for their students that will conclude today. Um, so thanks especially to Angela Mirso, Echo Ephraim, and Gracia Brown. Um, and not least, thank you also to the art students at VCSU who installed the exhibition. It will be on view through March 26th, so if you have not um, seen it already, I really hope that you'll make the time to see the work in person. Um, I grew up, as Angela already mentioned, on a third generation family farm and ranch in eastern Montana. Um, I feel like it's, it's a landscape similar enough um, for some of you in North Dakota that it might be um, familiar or relatable. Um, but in other places, I, I hear people describe this landscape as empty, isolated, even desolate. Um, my great grandfather and his brother homesteaded our family farm in 1913. Um, so it has been in my family for more than a century. Uh, my grandpa and his two brothers work, grew up working on the farm together and took the place over as partners. My dad and his two brothers took over the daily operation of the farm in the 1970s and 80s. And today, two of my uncles uh, continue to operate the farm. They raise small grains, including wheat and barley, dry peas, safflower, and cattle. Um, and the photographs that you're looking at, that's my great grandpa and his brother on the left, uh, my grandpa and his middle brother in the middle, and then, um, you know, my grandpa's on the left in the large family photo. My dad is the hairy guy on the right, and I am the little baby who decided Amanda, to. Amanda, yeah. before going on, could you make sure to share your screen? Because I just, we're oh, just really. Lord. Yep. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Let me. I thought I had already done that. Now? Can you see it, Angela? Yes, yeah, it's good. Okay, I'm so sorry. I was I was sharing it on my projector, but I had not pushed the button to share it with you. <laughs> um, so there are my, my family members. Um, I previously just um, showed you guys a, a, a an old family photo um, that shows some of the landscape of the farm. So until the turn of the 20th century, my story, the story of my family was really common. Um, about half of the U.S. workforce farmed. Today, it's increasingly less common. 
Um, only about 2% of the U.S. population works directly in agriculture these days, according to the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. I became aware that this background was increasingly rare about the same time that I was applying for graduate school. Um, so when I moved to Nebraska in 2013, I realized that these were some of the issues that I really wanted to make work about. Um, so I started off working in film, black and white film, and shooting on a medium format um, camera. I wanted to make artwork that would speak about the growth of corporate agriculture at the expense of family farming and the cost of the industrial agricultural model to the environment and also to people. Um, and I also wanted people to think about their own personal relationships to land and our culture's movement away from a deep connection to the places where we live. Um, so up here, you're seeing on the right, um, one of those uh, film images that I was talking about, um, black and white film. And on the left, um, this quotation comes from an, an interview that I did with a, with a farmer in Nebraska. I felt like I had a lot to learn, um, even though, you know, for for someone who doesn't live in either of those places, it might seem like agriculture would be really similar, um, regardless of where you is, of where you are. Um, obviously, it's very different. Um, so, as I started working in Nebraska, I was conscious that there was more rainfall, smaller farms, more expensive land, people growing different crops. Um, and I thought that the best way for me to begin was to start by asking questions. Um, I had previously worked as a reporter at a small newspaper, so I used that experience as my method. Um, I went to farmers markets at first to meet local farmers um, and did interviews with them and made portraits. Later on, I used um, connections through the, the university's um, programs in agriculture to make contacts with more families who were doing more conventional style agriculture. Um, and I was working in a style that was very consciously influenced by the work of Farm Security Administration photographers like Dorothea Lange from the 1930s. Um, at the same time, you know, so there were things that I really liked about beginning in this way. I really enjoyed building relationships um, with the individual farmers. I was really impressed with some of the things that people would say in our interviews and, and touched by the, um, the, the ways that they would speak about their experience. But the images weren't doing everything I wanted them to. They appealed mostly to an audience that was already converted, people who already cared about agriculture. And I, was tr I started to make some big shifts as I tried to make work that audience was, would connect to more emotionally. Well, I don't think the video is sharing here. Sorry, guys. Mm. Sorry, there always have to be some technical difficulties. I tried to click on the, the link of my presentation and it went away. So let me. Then we lost your screen share. Yeah, I apologize for that, guys. There have to be some uh, difficulties, right? Um, screen share is back. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. This should actually be showing you a, um, a video that I made but it appears to not be playing, um, which, oh, maybe there now. It is. Okay, good. Um, so this was one of the sort of big shifts that I made as I tried to make work that would help audiences connect more emotionally. Um, I was thinking about the, the idea that actually comes from fem feminism, um, that the personal is political. So I experimented with video and I thought about experience within a landscape. I made this video back in January 2015 when I went home to visit my family. Um, and I made audio recordings um, were the very first thing that I made as I was walking through my grandparents' former home, which is now empty. Um, the sound that you're hearing in the background is mostly the windmill outside. Um, and the image that you were looking at just there is from the inside of my grandparents' bedroom. And then a landscape um, with a dust storm kind of playing in the back. Um, so I combined that audio with some still photographs and the video piece actually sparked more discussion. Um, and it seemed to 
help people who didn't share my agricultural background or my interest in agriculture. Um, it seemed to help them connect to my work in, in a deeper way. So in a way, I think of that as the first piece um, in this project, Land People. Um, so using this project, I investigated the decline of family farming and the emotional and spiritual issues that underlie the eroding human relationship to land making larger universal relationships visible through my families and my own experience. So all the photographs that I'm going to show you now were taken on my family's land. Um, the series combines panoramic and aerial images of my family's farmland in Eastern Montana with intimate photographs of family members and domestic spaces. Um, and many of these are on display right now at McCarthy Gallery. Um, many of the images are visibly constructed using multiple photographs with exposed seams and overlapping edges to create a sense of multiple perspectives or shifting truths. Um, so this is one of the panoramic images that I'm showing you here. I'm kind of, I'm going to show you sort of two frames at a time and then you'll see the whole thing, which is five panels. Um, by using these multiple photographs to create a single image, I mean to suggest that no single view is adequate to capture the entirety of this vast landscape and the complex culture that depends on it. Each image can offer only a partial view, one piece of the larger picture. These formal elements also remind the viewer that my photographs are constructed, not transparent or objective, but carefully framed and presented by a particular person with a specific point of view. They deliberately call attention to my perspective, my view of movement through and representation of this place from the position of an insider to rural culture with the deep love and respect for both land and the people who work it. Um, so here is the whole photograph. It is the, the largest piece in the project. Um, and to give you a sense of scale, each of these prints is 30 inches tall by 22 inches wide. So the whole panorama is about 10 feet wide. Um, these photographs were taken a mile or two south of my family's land in a neighbor's pasture. Actually, this is the only one that's not um, on our land. My dad brought me here when I was a kid to show me depressions in these sandstone rocks that you're looking at, um, which still hold deep red stains in the rock. Um, he told me at the time that those depressions were made by native people using rocks to pound pemmican which is a high energy portable food made from dried jerky, pounded into a powder and mixed with fat and dried fruit. My culture's creation story comes from the homestead era and the Great Depression. It is a story about struggle, hardship, determination and resilience. That struggle was and is real, but the story starts from a false beginning point. Imagining the Great Plains as a vast, empty, unpeopled place. It was really important to me to recognize from the beginning of this project that that core concept is false. Um, there were people here before my family came and I want to recognize them um, and recognize that this land was never empty. Um, so now you're looking at um, a small, an, an image which is smaller when it's in person, you know, in the gallery. Um, it's a portrait of my uncle actually and, and his dog as he's driving the feed truck. Um, but photographs of people and interior state spaces are meant to contrast with that landscape in meaningful ways. In scale, um, so I mentioned already that they're a lot smaller in the sense of intimacy and also I hope with a sense of impermanence. There are two triptychs in the um, in the exhibition. This one that you're looking at right now is called Homestead House. Um, there's a second one called Kitchen Sink that I'll show you um, in the next slide. And those two triptychs are meant to echo and amplify each other. Speaking of history, progress, and the tenuous nature of agriculture in an arid landscape. Both of these image, the images show empty, abandoned structures. One is the homestead cabin built by my great grandfather, um, which my grandpa actually grew up in. And this one, um, kitchen sink, is the home that my grandparents lived in together for more than 50 years. Um, so together, I think that these two triptychs speak of my family's past in this place, as well as our future. 
um, foreshadowing a time when we too will be gone and my family may no longer farm this land. As I developed the project, I decided to try making aerial photographs of the farm because there were some panoramas I wanted to photograph that were simply too large and sprawling to see entirely from the ground. I worried at first that the aerial photographs would say the wrong thing, that they would imply that I had power over the land um, from that vantage point of viewing it from above. But I have found instead that these images give us perspective. They visualize the vast scale of this landscape and the relative tininess of human beings in it. Um, so for example, the photograph that you're looking at right now is um, two mule deer um, seen from above. So there's a, you know, a doe and a fawn and you can see them and their shadows. Um, the, these aerial images are displayed in a large grid which helps reference the Jeffersonian grid, um, which was the survey system that was used to understand, map, and to sell the American West to homesteaders like my ancestors. Um, that framework was formed at first by imaginary lines, but over the last 100 years, it has really become real, visible from above as an enormous quilt of square fields and round irrigation pivots. Um, many of you guys, if you've had the opportunity to fly over parts of the Midwest, have seen that sort of quilt on the land um, that we see from property lines um, and, and different fields of crops um, that are being grown. This grid is a visual representation of our culture's attitude toward land, an attitude of ownership and control imposed both abstractly and physically through fences, roads, and field boundaries. Today, my uncles raise more bushels of wheat than my grandpa and his brothers ever dreamed of, but it requires less human labor, larger machines, more chemicals, and more money than farming once did. It's harder to become a farmer today because of the high cost of land, machinery, and inputs a euphemistic word that means fertilizer, herbicide, and fuel, as well as seed. At its height, my family's land supported five families, nearly all of them with children. Today, it supports just two families, and none of the children intend to farm. Eric Schlosser wrote in the book, Fast Food Nation, since the end of World War II, farmers in the US have been persuaded to adopt one new technology after another hoping to improve their yields, reduce their costs, and outsell their neighbors. By embracing an industrial mode of agriculture, one that focuses narrowly on the levels of inputs and outputs, that encourages specialization in just one crop, that relies heavily on chemical fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, advanced harvesting, and irrigation equipment, American farmers have become the most productive farmers on earth. Every increase in productivity, however, has driven more American farmers off the land, and it has left those who remain beholden to the companies that supply the inputs and the processors that buy the outputs. Um, that's the end of the quote um, from that book. The framing of these views reflects my personal experience as a woman who grew up on a family farm and ranch owned and operated by men developing a deep love and respect for the land while also knowing that I would never inherit it. It is my position as an insider to this culture that sets my work apart from other art about agriculture. By exploring a single farm and family in depth, I intend to tell a complicated and specific story, one that reflects the changing nature of agriculture and critically questions its future. I have used this project to explore my feelings about the future of the farm and my status as a sort of simultaneous insider and outsider to the place where I grew up. I have been told by others that these photographs are all about loss, but I disagree. If you're looking only at the ruins, at the markers of human heartbreak and failure, it is easy to see lost. But if you look at the land itself, I think you can see hope. We tend to see landscape as a stage, a setting for human action, a backdrop, but that's not all land is. 
It has been my goal all along to give the land itself a voice. If you look at this land, at the plants and animals who live there, I think that you can see the hope in this project. So now I wanted to make just sort of a, a transition between um, showing you the, the work that was that is currently on display at McCarthy Gallery. Um, and I wanted to spend you know, most of our time on that. Um, but I also wanted to show you a little bit of my ongoing work, um, current project. So this is my website and you are welcome um, to visit it to see more, including videos and some of those other things. Um, my current project is called Oil and Water. Um, as Angela already mentioned, I live in Texas now. So I teach at a university um, which is in sort of southeast Texas. Um, Nacogdoches is about one hour north, I'm sorry, two hours north of Houston um, and about two hours west of Shreveport, Louisiana. So we're, you know, we're kind of right on near that border. Um, and I have been going down to the Gulf um, to photograph really, and, and just to visit, you know, it's sort of a novelty to live next to the ocean now, um, as you guys can understand, uh, being in North Dakota. Um, so I was interested to go down there and it, from the very first time that I went to the Gulf, I was really struck by the dual nature um, of the industries that it supports. Um, so one of those industries, and you can just barely see an oil tanker on the horizon and the image that you're looking at on the left, um, one of those industries is the oil industry. Um, so there are tons of refineries, offshore drilling rigs, um, all kinds of infrastructure that is related to the petrochemical industry down at the, the Texas Gulf. Um, and at the same time, there are many wildlife refuges and sanctuaries. It is a really, really important migration point um, for birds, especially who um, migrate across the ocean and stop um, right there at the Gulf to rest. Um, so I wanted to photograph those competing interests um, to sort of focus on that tension, um, to think about how this landscape is vitally important to both of those industries, um, but you know, the, the fact that they are also you know, inherently at odds. Um, the image that you're looking at on the left here, of course, is um, uh, a pump jack, and also behind it, it, I don't know if you can see um, the text very well, but a little um, billboard for condos in the area saying, live the dream. Um, and then the image on the right here is from uh, a wildlife viewing platform um, at one of the sanctuaries that's right down there at the coast. Um, I was very fortunate to be able to make a trip down there to photograph um, in March, right before the COVID shutdown. Um, so I was actually, um, you know, I was in my car driving around by myself, you know, photographing wildlife sanctuaries. Um, when everything really started shutting down and, and we were advised to socially distance. Um, and as you can see, you know, from that previous image of the, the viewing platform, there are a few better places um, to socially distance than wildlife refuges when you're the only one there. Um, so I was really able to um, photograph a lot at the sort of the beginning of the migration season last spring. Um, and I am looking forward to being able to return to the Gulf um, this spring and summer to make more photographs as part of this project. Uh, I'm really hoping to be able to um, collaborate with scientists, including not only, um, you know, biologists who study birds and um, sort of the importance of the Gulf ecosystem um, to different species, but also with people who work in the oil industry um, and potentially, you know, some of the um, you know, the workers who take part in that economy as well um, to get more of a perspective um, to share. So that is the end of the work that I had to share with you guys today. Um, I would be very happy to hear any questions um, either about the land people work that is on exhibit um, at Valley City or, you know, um, the newer work, if you're curious about that. Yes, these, this is exciting just to see, especially the oil and water going from landing people. That's just a very interesting, in my opinion, as a curator and artist who's a painter, 
seen the photography work into the oil and water. Was it just from the natural, just moving down to Texas that gave you that interest, Amanda? Or I would say so. You know, I um, you mentioned, and I, I kind of included in my bio that I'm an artist who is probably always interested in the relationships between people and land. Um, so, you know, a working landscape in Montana or North Dakota is generally an agricultural landscape. Um, and so, you know, and that was my background and where I was coming from when I made the work um, and was living in Nebraska. And then when I came down to Texas, you know, the landscape is very different and the ways that you might work in the landscape are very different. Um, so the Gulf was really the first thing that captured my attention um, that I really wanted to explore through my work. Also with your family, how were they when you were taking photos? I guess that's my question of, you're taking photos of the land, were they like fine with it or were they questioning, I guess? Yeah, um, you know, they were 100% fine with it. I think they're um, pretty much used to me making photographs by now. Um, you know, I've, I've been making photographs for, I guess, about 25 years now. So, you know, at this point they're resigned. Um, and in many ways they were actually very, very helpful. Um, you know, some of the sites that I photographed, um, I mentioned, you know, that there was a, a story that my dad told me that was sort of embedded in why I went to this site or why I went to that site. Um, I think I grew up in a family that is big on storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of places that I photographed that were, you know, the, sort of the subject of a story. Um, the aerial photographs were made with the help of one of my uncles who is a pilot and has a small plane. Um, I think that's kind of a, that's a fun story for people. Um, you know, so he's got the small plane and I've been flying it ever since I was a kid. You know, he's taken us for sort of rides just for fun. Um, but uh, on this occasion, you know, flying to photograph, he first offered, you know, the, the only window that can open on the plane is about this big, you know, it's just a tiny little round window about the same size as the end of my lens, as it turned out. Um, and so, you know, immediately he offered to take the door off so that I would be able to photograph better. Um, and this is obviously in the middle of the winter and it was super cold. And I had this fear that I would fall out of the plane if there were no door, right? Um, so I was like, no, no thanks. I'll just photograph through the window, it'll be fine. You know, and so the first time we went up, um, you know, I was photographing through that small hole. And then the second time, you know, he assured me that I would not fall out of the plane. And if I wanted to, he, I, he would strap me in. And so I had him take the door off the plane and he strapped me in with like a bungee cord. And in fact, there, there's no force trying to pull you out of the plane. So, um, so he was right. He knew things that I did not know. And, and so he made, you know, a couple flights over the farm for me, you know, circling and, and trying to notice things that would be interesting. Um, and so my family was really supportive and I couldn't possibly thank them enough um, for all that they've done on this to, to help me make this project. Awesome. Um, can you comment on the gear you use, the camera lenses? Um, I have a question about. Yes. Um, so most of this project was shot with my own DSLR. Um, it's a Canon 6D, um, which was sort of the, you know, as a graduate student, it was the least expensive full frame DSLR that I could purchase. Um, and I already owned a Canon lens, so it was kind of um, easy. So that most of the photographs were um, were made with that. The large panoramas were actually made with a camera that belongs to the University of Nebraska, which is a medium format digital Hasselblad um, and a tremendously expensive camera, um, makes a much, much higher resolution file. Um, so, you know, I mentioned that those, so the largest prints are 22 by 30, so they're quite large prints. I could easily print them bigger. Um, you know, it's it's a very high resolution, and each one of those is a separate photograph, you know, which also helps you make a bigger total image. Um, but, you know, you have the limitations of trying to ship the work somewhere. Um, so you want it to be, <laughs> you want it to fit in a crate somewhere. Um, but it was a lot of fun, you know, being able to access that equipment um, and to use that. Um, you know, I obviously made multiple trips to the farm to photograph, so it was after I had been there several times before I went back with the Hasselblad um, and, you know, 
had definite ideas in mind of what I was going to use it for. And um, maybe another thing that the North Dakota audience particularly could appreciate is that there was one morning that I was photographing using the Hasselblad and it was quite cold. You know, it was probably 10 below or something like that. And uh, the Hasselblad stopped working and started giving me this error message. And I was terrified that I had just broken the department's $40,000 camera. Um, and it turned out that it was just too cold, right? All batteries struggle when it's that cold. Your car battery, your camera battery. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> My phone never rings, but here it is. Ring. Um, okay, I think I told it to stop. No, I tried to tell it. Um, sorry, I hung up on you, whoever you are. <laughs> um, maybe I should have taken that off the hook the whole time and I never thought of it. Um, so anyway, that was just a, a funny experience that I felt like you guys could probably relate yeah. to. Um, and can you say one more time how you did the aerial photos? They just want, if you yes. just said this. Uh, Yes, and hello, Chris. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, so yeah, the aerial photographs were made from my uncle's plane. Um, so a small plane, um, we did make a point to fly when the light would be at a really low angle. Um, again, something that probably the, um, you know, the folks in North Dakota can relate to is when you have a landscape that is, you know, it's not mountainous, um, it's, you know, somewhat, some people would call it flat. I might not call it flat, um, but to really illustrate the relief for that relief to, to jump out at you, you need to photograph it with the, when the light is at a low angle. Um, and so to have that more interesting lighting and texture, um, we flew very early in the morning when the, the sun was just coming up. Um, you could also fly, you know, in the evening when the sun was going down, but the advantage of flying in the morning was of course that, you know, it would still be light when you wanted to land. Um, so that was, it seemed like a great advantage. Um, so we made the, a couple of flights um, over the farm early in the morning. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the first time I photographed through the window and the second time my uncle took the door off for me, which was super cold, um, but much, much better for photographing. So I highly recommend it. Awesome. <laughs> Um, so thank you, Eric Greenlee, Chris Ireland, for those questions. And we have another one from Hannah Aberley, who's asking, what advice do you have for students who are going to be doing an exhibition in Artist Talk soon? Yeah, so congratulations, Hannah, <laughs> if that is the case. Um, you know, I think the most important thing for either an exhibition or an Artist Talk is that you have a, a really well-developed body of work. Um, you know, photographers tend to work, at least, you know, in, in contemporary times, um, in more of a series kind of a way, um, which is not true, I, I think, for all visual artists. Um, but it's nice if your work relates to, you know, your different pieces relate to each other in terms of the big ideas that you're presenting um, or in some, you know, aspect of the process um, or even just aesthetically, you know, they have something in common. Um, so they're going to work together well in an exhibition. Um, and then, you know, as you, you know, so as you're developing the work, you should at the same time be developing research about the ideas that are behind the work. Um, you know, so for me, I actually enjoy writing. Um, I don't, I don't hate writing like some artists do. Um, so I do a lot of writing at the time that I'm making the work. You know, so maybe I'm, you know, I go out and I start photographing and thinking about what the ideas are that I might be representing. Um, and then I would go home and begin writing an artist statement, right? Um, and start to put down on paper what my thoughts are um, about what this work is about. And then I would let that, you know, direct me towards more research. And then the research would help shape the future photographs that I might make. Um, or they might change aspects of my process, right? Make me think about, well, what is missing? You know, what else do I need to include in this work? Um, so, you know, I kind of go back and forth, right? From the exhibit to the research, um, back to the images, back to the research. Um, and then I think, you know, to develop an artist talk, you, to me, you write, you write at least a statement and possibly, you know, a more academic paper where you're gonna include some sources, some citations, you know, your research isn't 
part of your research is visual. You know, it's making the images, it's making the artwork. And part of your research is reading about other people who've made related work um, about some of the issues that you're making work about. Um, so you really have to do, be doing both. That's a good question, especially since we have a couple seniors coming up doing their show this semester and actually next year. So thank you, Amanda, for that answer. Yeah. And, you know, if you were here from the very beginning of the um, of this talk, I was showing you some of the work that sort of led up to the project. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's in some way, that's kind of my intention um, is to share that with the student audience where, you know, the first thing that I did isn't necessarily what I ended up doing. You know, like I, I started here and I saw what was good about it and what its limitations were, how it was reaching my audience, in what ways it was not reaching my audience, and then, you know, sort of adjusted um, and changed my methods and the visuals. Um, you know, I changed from film to digital, from black and white to color. Um, I, I changed a lot in terms of scale um, so, you know, really made a lot of big changes um, in developing this work and trying to successfully communicate my ideas. Do you think it's important for students to experiment, like you were saying, going from black and white photography to color to digital? Do you, do you feel it's, as being an assistant professor yourself, it's important for students to experiment different mediums and materials as they're researching? Absolutely. You know, um, you might not try that many different um, technical approaches when it comes to just one series of work. You know, um, I was in the situation of being in graduate school, you know, where that was all I was doing really was developing this work. Um, so I had all of that time and energy to put into it. And, and that's why it probably changed as much as it did. Um, you know, but I think for students, it's really important to try different processes and to think about working on, on different ideas because you haven't found yourself yet, right? You haven't figured out um, what is a good fit for you in terms of how you like to work um, or the maybe the aesthetic that is most exciting to you or even the ideas that you care most about. Um, so I think it's really important to experiment in all of those areas. Um, and then, you know, at some point you got to pick something, right? And stick to it for a while so that you can get good at it um, and make really successful work that, um, that is successful technically and aesthetically. Is there any photo techniques that you haven't tried, Amanda, that you're hoping to try in the future or? Sure. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, none of us have tried everything. <laughs> uh, maybe somebody has, um, not me. So um, there's a lot of stuff that I would like to try in the future. Um, on my short list is actually photographing with a drone. Um, so I don't, I don't live in Montana anymore. I don't have my uncle handy and I can't say like, let's go up in the plane. Um, and I did really enjoy having that aerial perspective. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to be able to photograph um, around the Gulf. It's also, it's a little tricky at the Gulf because there's a lot of controlled airspace. Um, understandably, you know, the, um, the oil refineries and chemical plants don't really want you flying over them. Um, so I'll, I have to figure that out. Um, but I'd really like to photograph down there um, from the drone. Oh, good Lord. Go away. Call back later. Um. <laughs> Maybe I can, could I unplug? <laughs> Folks, as you're turning, tuning in, don't be afraid to send a question. This is our question <laughs> answer time. <laughs> so please but don't call because I won't answer you. <laughs> yes. Don't call Amanda. <laughs> I'll answer you later, right? Yeah. But not right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know what were we talking about? <laughs> uh, new technique in photography. Oh. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the drone is kind of on my my short list for my personal work. Um, you know, we're the workshop that we're sharing with students. Um, we sort of got started on Wednesday, and we're concluding this afternoon. Um, is cyanotype, 
which is an old process, right? So I don't think that my exploration isn't limited to new technology and new processes. I'm also interested in older analog hands-on processes. Mm -hmm. um, I took a bookmaking class this past summer and I really love making um, you know, handmade artist books and thinking about how work is differently when you look at it in that really intimate you know, way, right in your own hands, in your own living room. Um, so I'd like to work more with that. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of possibility. Um, what advice would you give to students who are non-art majors who are taking like an art class? You know, I think just be open-minded um, and sort of, you know, of course, art making should be fun. <laughs> Even if it's your job, art making should still be fun. Um, you know, the creative process should be enjoyable. Um, so I think, you know, if you're, if you're taking an art class or if you're considering taking an art class, um, absolutely enjoy it, have fun with it. Um, be willing to try things. Don't expect to be good at something immediately or think that if you're not good at something immediately, it means that you're not meant to be an artist, right? Um, you know, I think I have a toddler, right? Um, so I have a three-year-old and right now he's just arrived at the age where he, he thinks that he's drawing things, right? And he tells mm -hmm. you what he's drawn. So right now he draws a lot of dinosaurs, right? Um, they don't look like dinosaurs, but <laughs> he says they're dinosaurs, <laughs> you know? So right now he believes in himself, right? And he is enjoying drawing and he's drawing things that he is interested in. Um, I, have, I have been the kid who got to a certain age and stopped believing that my drawings were any good or of any interest to anybody. And that sucks the fun out of it, right? Mm -hmm. To be so judgmental about yourself. Um, so I think you have to be, you know, you have to be willing to suspend that judgment and to realize that art is like everything else. You know, you get better at it when you do it more. So the more that you practice drawing, the more that you practice throwing pots, the more that you practice making photographs, the better you're going to get at it. Um, and you just have to give yourself that time. Yep, and that's, I think, it's the important thing as in working artists, I think, for both of us and all who are watching in. Um, from Kirsten Bachman, what was the biggest surprise of you completing this particular project with, I think, Land and People? Huh. <laughs> Try and think, like, what would be... You know, maybe initially, I was surprised that I ended up going home um, to make these photographs. You know, so I mentioned at the beginning, I was at the University of Nebraska Lincoln as a graduate student when I started making this work. And I started off photographing there, you know, photographing right where I was. Um, and I made a lot of photographs in Nebraska um, for really the first year and a half, um, two years of grad school. Um, and, you know, continued to, of course, because that's where I was most of the time. Um, but when I made um, the video that I shared, um, which was just made, you know, it was like a Christmas trip home. And um, actually my, my great uncle, my grandpa's brother had passed away and he was the last person of that generation um, on the farm. And it felt like a really important change to me for that generation to sort of be gone. And it made me think more about the future of the farm, you know, where we had come from and where we were going and, and what that meant for me um, personally. And so I made this very personal artwork where I had been, up to then I had been making sort of documentary style artwork. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as I made this, you know, really personal piece and came back and showed that to people, um, I was really surprised by how strongly they responded to it. Um, and that's what really encouraged me to continue photographing at home and to telling my family story. Um, because I realized that because, maybe because it was more emotional to me, they connected it to it on a more emotional level. Um, and that's, I think that's really important. You know, if you're, if people only connect to your work um, on an intellectual level, if they don't feel it somehow, um, it means less to them. Um, and they're less likely to spend very much time with it. 
Um, so that was really, that was, I think, a surprise um, and not something that I initially intended. And of course, it was less convenient um, to be trying to make photographs um, that were 14 hours away. But, uh, you know, but I would make my tests there in Nebraska, test different techniques, um, you know, make the early panoramas and experiment with different ways of doing that, um, and then take advantage of any opportunity to go home um, and to photograph there. You said with the emotional connection, um, with your new work that's coming out with oil and water, what emotional connection are you hoping to achieve there for the viewer looking at your work? You know, I think a lot of it, a lot of the impact and, and the emotional connection in that work comes through through the wildlife um, and through the use of light and color, you know, so to describe a really beautiful place um, that is so valuable to these migrating birds and to give people that sense of, you know, I think we think of nature with a capital N right, where, uh, you know, this is big, beautiful nature and these, um, and, and yet also very delicate, you know, so um, somewhat fragile, right? Um, and then to contrast that with the petrochemical industry, um, and, you know, it's, it's obvious to almost anybody that those would be competing in interests. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it gives us a real sense of the potential threat to the wildlife, um, and as I continue talking to people who live and work down there, um, I'm hoping that their stories will also um, give some emotional impact um, to the work. That storytelling that I feel, I guess you could probably agree, Amanda, that storytelling is probably like one of the biggest impact as an artist, right? In this yeah, story. storytelling is huge, you know, and I don't, you don't have to make portraits, but there needs to be a human hand I think very often um, for many people to relate to the work, um, you know, so even in, you know, many of the photographs that are on display there as part of land people, you know, I was photographing the interior of my grandparents' home, um, even the interior of my uncle's home. There are relatively few photographs of people, but there are many photographs of people's things, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a photograph of a growth chart on the wall, right, where they've recorded the heights of their children as they grew. Um, you know, and I think that all of those, that, that story, that narrative um, is something that we can relate to, right, on a very personal and individual level. Um, and so then, you know, that, I think that storytelling becomes a really important tool to connect to an audience. Which my question uh, to you, Amanda, what's your favorite piece of the show of Land and People? If there's one that's your favorite. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, you know, it probably is uh, the large one that I, um, you know, the big panorama, Pemmican Rocks, um, because I, it is so connected to my dad and memories of that place. Um, and also, you know, just the the beauty of the sky and the way that it, you know, very gradually changes color. Um, that one was photographed really at the end of the day. Um, so just as the, the light was really disappearing. Um, and it's, you know, I just, I love that photograph. Um, could you explain, because I know of how we hung your show, it's not a traditional format of being framed behind glass, but more behind plywood, on plywood? Yes. Um, so, you know, uh, there were lots of, there's lots of things that you take into account when you're thinking of how to um, frame your work and exhibit your work. Um, and one of the big things for me when I was framing that work was um, the panoramas, you know, and considering how I would be able to um, show those on the wall without having a frame interrupt your view and sort of cut that panorama into chunks. Um, so I didn't want that to happen. I wanted it to be really seamless so that you would see them as different photographs, but also be able to see them as a single image. Um, and so that's how I first arrived at that idea of, of mounting the artwork um, without a frame. And then, um, you know, the particular wood that I decided to put it on, it's like a, you know, it's a multi-layered Baltic birch plywood, um, which is sort of like the highest quality plywood. Um, that doesn't warp, right? So that being important, you know, just that it will last um, and that it will work. And then, you know, you had to, I had to do tests of, um, you know, a coating. So I would put a protective spray coating on the prints first and then adhere them to the 
um, the wood using an archival paste and, you know, coat the edges of the, you know, so it was kind of a, a involved process. Um, but I actually, I really enjoy that part of the work as well. You know, being in the work, the wood shop and um, getting to do all of that yourself is really satisfying. It's not for everybody. You know, some people would rather just buy frames, put their images in frames and that's totally cool too. Yeah. I mean, and I agree being able to work in the wood shop, but just making that last stage of like, here's my last part of framing my piece. It's like you have done the whole process and mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's bad taking stuff to go get framed. I just think there's something more personal and unique when you do the whole process from beginning to end. Yeah. Yeah. And I just really enjoy being in the woodshop too. You know, it's, I find it very, you know, it's just more working with your hands. So if yep. you enjoy working with your hands, why not make your own frames? <laughs> um, um, I see, yeah. Another question there. Um, are there images in your body of work that reflects a different message than your main message of your body of work? That's a good question. You know, I think really my message was, or my, my idea was big and complex. Um, and so I felt like there were a lot of different aspects of that question that I needed to address through my photographs. Um, so I think that, you know, different photographs address different parts of the idea, you know, so for example, um, you know, the, the panoramas address that idea that, that it is complex, that you can't see it all at once, um, address the idea of change, right, over time, because, you know, each of those photographs, while we're looking at it as though it were a single image, each one is a separate photograph that was actually made at a different moment. Mm. Um, you know, so time is always important in photography, I think. Um, you know, in the, there's a, an image of my aunt looking out the window, um, you know, and that one I was, I was very much thinking about, um, you know, the, you might've noticed as I was going through the litany of, of who owned the farm and ran the farm that they were all men, right? It was my great grandpa and his brother, my grandpa and his two brothers, my dad and his two brothers. Um, you know, they incorporated the farm in the seventies and they named it Bright Bob Brothers, right? There's no sisters farming. <laughs> <laughs> right. My dad had three sisters. They didn't farm. Um, so I was really thinking about that when I made that photograph and, and trying to think of how I could represent, um, you know, the the idea that the women on the farm were not, um, you know, that there was a barrier for us um, to being part of that work. Um, so, you know, so different photographs, I think, address different parts of the idea. Um, you know, the grid, of course, the aerials kind of mm -hmm. address that idea of ownership and of the, the history of land ownership in that area. Um, so I had a, a lot of ideas um, and I had to sort of try to make them all work together and be really cohesive. Um, and I think the same is going to be true. Um, you know, oil and water I've only been working on for, um, I don't know, if, I don't know if 2020 counts as a whole year. Um, but sort of for two years, um, but with one of those years being, you know, less, less easy to work. Yes. Um, right. Everybody's experienced that. Um, but I think that there are, you know, related mm -hmm. ideas within that big project um, and different images will sort of address different portions of that concept. Are you hoping to ever go back and photograph on your family ranch again, just to like when the ending of your father or uncles stop farming. Or... You know, maybe not. Um, <laughs> that might be too painful, honestly. Um, my dad actually did pass away a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And so, and, but he was actually, he was not farming. Mm -hmm. um, he passed away. He had already, there was, family tension and he left. Um, so uh, my two uncles do still live on the farm. Um, they are a, they're nearing the age of gentleman farmer, farmerness um, when they will, you know, lease out the land to others and let them do the physical labor of farming. But I think continue to enjoy their, their rural lifestyle. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't want to photograph the end um, in that sense. I think it was more interesting to me to photograph, you know, this idea of change and evolution. Um, and if you were, to, if I were to go and photograph the end, there would be something very final about that rather than leaving it sort of open-ended. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and then also, um, you know, very sad rather than having a sense of hope. Um, because, you know, not all change, change doesn't have to be bad, even if it feels uncomfortable at the time that it's happening. Um, and I have a lot of hope for the future of agriculture. So I don't want to, I don't want to photograph anything that feels closed um, and negative. More positive you're looking for. In you know, I, I don't think it can be purely positive either, but I want there to be some hope. Um, you know, I, I do think it's com complicated. You know, I don't think that, I don't think that my family has done everything right or that, you know, that I don't believe in this idea of, you know, the farmer being inherently good and the, the career of a farmer being always um, good for the land or good for even themselves. Um, there's a lot of criticism um, of the agricultural industry um, in my work, but I also want to have a lot of compassion and love for the people who are doing that work. We're all flawed human beings and we can only do our best, you know? So I think that that's what I really want to communicate in that work. So you're probably done with the land and people and just moving on straightly to the oil and water. Cause I know you had a couple other series going on in progress too. Yeah. You know, um, again, you know, oil and water again is photographing not mm -hmm. right outside my door. Um, so it's, you know, it's not as far, it's only a three hour drive to the coast, um, instead of, you know, the further drive from Nebraska to Montana. Um, but I'm still, you know, I, I make photographs on my, in my everyday life, you know, in my family and surroundings immediately. And then I also, you know, make these trips to the coast. So those end up being sort of different work just because they're made in very different places and kind of reflect different feelings and ideas. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm done photographing my family. Okay. Uh, or making work about my family. Um, I would, you know, if I went back to the farm or when I go back to the farm, when, when I can travel again, um, I would, I certainly would photograph again. I wouldn't go there with like that, you know, that single-minded purpose mm -hmm. the way that I did when I was making this project. Um, you know, you guys can probably relate when you go visit your family, most of your time is spent visiting your family, yeah. right? And, and talking to the people that you love and spending time with them. So, you know, I, I will certainly make visits to the farm in the future where I do that. Probably I will still make some photographs just because I find that landscape really beautiful. Um, and, and I can always think of more things that I would photograph there. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily put them within the same project. And I, I definitely wouldn't want to have that idea of, of an ending. Okay. Completely understand. Would yeah. you suggest um, any readings for students to read of like, in the contemporary sense of any art prac, any art books that students should read or even non-artists? You know, I mean, there's, there's sort of the old classics. Um, you know, we, I think just last, last year, maybe last fall, it seems like so long ago, um, <laughs> but I was part of a, a seminar class for our graduating BFA students. Um, and then our graduate students take it as well. Um, and we had some reading discussions with both groups. For the undergraduate students, um, we took a reading from Art and Fear, which probably, you know, everybody who's faculty on here probably has read before. Um, and it's, you know, it's a small book. Um, it's simply written, um, very accessible and relatable. And I think really useful in terms of just thinking about, um, you know, why do we make art? What stops us from making art? Um, you know, and how can we sort of get past those things? Um, and then for the uh, graduate students, I had them read a more contemporary essay by the art critic Jerry Saltz. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to remember exact the exact title, but I think it was, you know, like my life as a failed artist or something like this, you know, which sounds really negative. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, he, he earnestly tried very hard to be a working artist at the beginning of his career and ultimately became a critic. Um, who looks at other people's artwork and writes about it. And he shared that experience um, really candidly in that essay. Um, and it was, again, you know, it was kind of about those obstacles. Um, you know, so those were readings for, you know, students who are working in a variety of media and coming at different levels. Um, and I think that they're useful for those reasons, um, you know, because they're not, they're not tied to one media. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. And... 
don't see any other questions. I guess, do you have any last advice for folks who have seen your show? Any advice for our North Dakotians? <laughs> um, you know, if, if you've already seen the show, I'm delighted. Thank you so much for going to see it. Um, you know, if, if this talk brought up questions that you hadn't considered, you might go look at it again and see, um, see if it looks different. Um, if you're looking at it with sort of differently informed eyes. Um, if you haven't seen the show, please do go see it in person. Um, it's so much better in person than it is on a screen. I agree. Um, thank you. <laughs> right. Um, and I think that's true of almost everybody's work. So, you know, get out and see art um, as much as you can. I know those opportunities aren't, they don't come as easily um, when you live in North Dakota or where, when you live in a rural place. Um, but when you have those opportunities, you've really got to make the most of them. Um, and then, you know, take advantage of this digital world that we're living in um, to look at art that way. Even if it's not as good, it's still good, you know. Um, and I and just keep making whatever it is that you make, you know, sort of follow that thread and, and just keep making stuff. Awesome. And I think we are at the end. Amanda, thank you very, very much for joining us today and just for accepting to being up here at VCSU. I know this is a different world than normal, but we please do come up and visit us here at Valley City State University. We have a brand new building coming very soon. We would love to show you <laughs> and yeah. to take part. Um, and for everybody else who's tuned in, thank you. And if you're gonna see the recording, thank you for watching this. Please follow Amanda on Instagram and um, on her website. And also please follow the VCSU Art Department on Facebook and Instagram to see more information about our next artist talk and our senior shows. So thank you all again and have a great weekend.